all you heroes, hawks, heralds, crows, pirates, and wardens. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we unpack, discuss, and galaxy brain about all the lore behind the Dragon Age series. We are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe, from character deep dives to exalted marches and elven gods. We will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hello and welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we talk about Dragon Age and its lore. I'm one of your hosts, Austin, also known as Teacup. And I'm your other host, Shelby or Sheacup. And we're here to continue to talk about our Evanuris series, and we are here with our episode on Dirthamin. That's right. You may be familiar with this one because he does have a temple that we can go to in Inquisition, but we'll get into all of that later. Um, But first, let's talk about some fun facts. You ready to get into it, Austin? I am. All right. So the first fun fact I have today is that you can actually find a unique ring in Dragon Age 2 at Master Island's shop in Sundermount. This item is a ring named Dirthamin's Secret, which is a pretty apt name. And this ring does electricity damage and it increases your nature resistance. Hmm. Now, interestingly enough, we talked last week about how Falandin had a weapon named after him that was Falandin's Reach. Well, You can find another weapon named after Dirthamin in this one. This is a shield named Dirthamin's Wisdom that you can loot in the Lost Temple of Dirthamin. And the interesting part of this is its description, which I wanted to read. And the description says, This shield's power has kept it whole after a thousand years and might even have saved the entire Temple of Dirthamin from decay. It held special significance to the elven priests, perhaps allowing communion with the God of Secrets himself. I find Hmm. that to be interesting. And then my last fun fact is that you can indeed, can indeed meet an elven priest who is specifically the last high priest to Dirthamon, but we'll tell you more about that later. Yeah. Lots of interesting facts. Um... I never play a, like, warrior shield, like a sword and shield warrior in DAI, so I've never used that said shield, but all very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So let's uh, let's just dive right into everything we know about Dirthamon. Are you ready to go? I am ready to go. Okay, so let's get into the names, which we talk about first all the time. And there's really only one that we know of, two kind of, but they go together. So we have God of Secrets, like we just mentioned, and then we have Keeper of Secrets. And something I wanted to specifically call out is in regard to this name, Keeper of Secrets. Now, if you know anything about Dragon Age Elven lore, you know that the leaders of Dalish clans are called keepers. So I I just wonder, is this where that honorific comes from? Is it merely a coincidence? Which I find hard to believe anything's a coincidence in Dragon Age, but it's just a really, um, really interesting coincidence that it would it would happen. Yeah, um, I definitely think that the specific to the name keeper, especially keeper of secrets and the keeper's role which I'm sure you, as you probably touched on, uh, they are the keeper of what little about their elven culture that the Dalish do know. They're the ones who are guarded with safekeeping those, not that knowledge and that secrets. I think it, I think it's probably connected, given that his role in his domain, Dirthamin's domains, it's likely that the role of keeper is connected to that. 
Yeah, I think that's fair. And so, you know, you've kind of already gone down this path. Let's talk about his domains. So he has two, which are kind of the same thing, two sides of the same coin, if you will. Um, his domains are secrets and knowledge. So, yes, those are two separate things, but they're very much related. And I do think, you know, this also goes along with his brother being, or his twin rather, being the god of death. Um, there's a lot of secrets that people take to the grave, right? There's a lot of knowledge about death, what lies beyond um, the rituals surrounding death, religious and secular rituals. And so, I think both of those two things make complete sense given what we know about Dirthamon even prior to this episode. Mm -hmm. um, so he does have three animals that he is uh, often symbolized with. And so those are two ravens, specifically two ravens, a bear, and then a Vartoral. We'll get into a little bit more about the Vartoral later, but just keep in mind he's associated with all three of those animals. Um, and now the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about in this introductory period is, you know, last week we discussed how Fallon Den is often depicted in statues as a kind of stern man pointing. Well, interestingly enough, Dirthamon is occasionally at least depicted as a cloaked kneeling person. And we actually see two different instances of this. One in the Citadel du Corbeau in the Exalted Plains, and then again during the final peace battle. Both of those do come from Inquisition, whereas some of the Fallon Den statues were more spread out across all three games. But I do think it's an interesting connection that these two gods who are twins seem to be the ones most frequently depicted as statues of people doing things, statues of people that could also be interpreted as humans, where they're the gods of death and knowledge, things that perhaps are more intrinsic to all species rather than just the elves. It is interesting because I think we do obviously get some kind of like we know who Dirthamon was before Inquisition, but again, this just we get so much elven lore in Inquisition. Just, and I think that's solely because of the places we visit and what codexes need to be written about the places. I mean, we go to literally where the Exalted March on the Dales was fought. We go to the Emerald Graves, which is literally the graves of those Dalish that were killed in said yeah. Exalted March and. Yeah. yeah, a lot of like lore heavy places that we go to in Inquisition completely agree with that. And I do think Dirthamon, other than Fenharel, other than Mithal, I think Dirthamon is probably the, the third Evanuris that gets expanded the most in Inquisition because mm -hmm. we go to his temple. Um, and, and that's just natural, I think. So let's um, let's just use this as a, a moment to move right along and talk about Dirthamon's roles and relationships within the Evanuris. So last week we discussed Fallon Din and we touched on the relationship between Fallon Din and Dirthamon. They are twins. They are both said to be the eldest children of Mithal and Elgernon. They are twins of some kind, and they have a very deep association with one another. And just basically, if you haven't listened to last week's episode on Fallon Den, definitely go back and listen to that one because we really talk about their relationship in detail. I don't want to do a lot of repeating um, just because we talked about it last week. And so if you haven't listened to that episode, just go back and listen to it. You'll understand their relationship a little bit better, and we're just not going to – we're not going to repeat ourselves, but – I'm giving you the basics. They're twins. They're the eldest of Mithal and Elgernon, and they've always been associated with each other. Um, but we are going to build on the foundation that we started with last week on their relationship because I read from the Dirthamon Keeper of Secrets Codex about their story and like the the kind of like creation myth surrounding how they came to be associated with their domains um, about how Fallon Den finds this doe that needs help getting it to the afterlife. And he helps the doe and Dirthamon can't follow. 
And he spends like the rest of his life looking for Falandin. We talked about all that. So we're going to read the rest of this codex, the second half um, right now. So this is what it says. Dirthamen tried to follow them, but the shifting gray paths beyond the veil would not let him. Separated for the first time from Valandin, Dirthamen wandered aimlessly till he came across two ravens. You are lost, and soon you will fade, the raven said fear. The raven named fear said to Dirthamen. Your brother has abandoned you. He no longer loves you, said the other, named Deceit. I am not lost, and Falandin has not abandoned me, replied Dirthamen. He subdued the ravens and bade them carry him to Falandin. This they did, for they had been defeated and were now bound to Dirthamen's service. When Dirthamen found Falandin, he found also the deer, who once again was light on her feet, for her spirit was released from her weakened body. Both Falandin and Dirthamen rejoiced to see this. Falandin vowed that he would remain to carry all the dead to their place beyond, just as he did the deer. And Dirthamen stayed with him, for the twins cannot bear to be apart. Mm -hmm. So I've got a couple things. Um, Go ahead. There should. Uh, the first thing is that Dirthamen tried to follow, but the shifting gray paths beyond the veil would not let him. My question in this is that, like you know. Could this imply that this story is taking place after or as the Eminurus are being banished from the world? Yeah, it's possible. Um, I think it's definitely possible. I think more likely, though, is this was this kind of myth was created retrospectively and then like applied later on because it doesn't really make sense in some of the events that we know of um like why would they build this temple of secrets if if Dirthamon wasn't really over that domain yet you know and similarly to Fallon Den why would he be associated with death if that hadn't happened yet? Mm -hmm. Right. I just think it's interesting that Dirthamon decides to like stay with him for twins cannot bear to be apart. Um, there's a lot of mythology that deals with several things about this twins wanting to be together or people who have been separated too long to be apart. Like, you know, the, the, the Greek myth that the sky and the earth long to be together, but they're kept apart because they, when they're together, it destroys the world or whatever, you know, Atlas holds up the sky and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I just think that's an interesting thing that they're bringing in here of like Dirthamon and these twins cannot bear to be apart, but I'm really interested of like why the Raven, because Ravens sometimes are, in like our real world mythology, like associated with dark things, um, not in like Norse mythology, but like ravens are Odin spies in sometimes in North myth mythology and Odin is definitely, I would definitely say he's not the god of secrets, but he has enough secrets to almost be the god of secrets. Yeah, and I do think that when we consider Dirthamon's temple, um, which we'll get into a little bit later, I do think that the ravens make sense because it is very horror. It is very dark. It is very um, murderous, frankly. And so I think I think when you think about stories that are about this like kind of relentless pursuit of knowledge, like the most the some of the oldest stories in english about the kind of relentless pursuit of knowledge go back to alchemy go back to the fountain of youth and both of these mm -hmm. things are like very much portrayed as dark evil pursuits and so i think we have a tendency to say oh knowledge like that's a good thing it's good to have education yes mm -hmm. it is um but i also think there is a more sinister aspect when 
it becomes a rampant or unchecked desire to hoard and amass and gather as much knowledge as possible and as many secrets as possible. I think that's where it starts to turn. And so I do see that in Dertheman. I do see that kind of um, darker urge in him, if you will. And I also think, I also think generally ravens are associated with death. Um, And so with Dertheman's association with his brother, I think that also makes sense. Um, But another thing I wanted to go back to with the Codex, at least, is the first raven, what they say, um, fear. The raven named fear says, you are lost and soon you will fade. To me, that's like that stuck out because it's like, okay, Mm -hmm. well, the the fade. Um, There's no way that's a coincidence either. And so it's just fun little wordplay that I appreciate. But I also think it's interesting with the Ravens, it's just like they say two mean insults and Dertheman's like, nah, bro. And they're like, okay, we bow to you as our master for the rest of eternity. It's like you failed one dice roll and you're just going to give up like forever. It's Mm -hmm. just kind of funny to me that he just one thing, like one time, one thing forever. The Ravens are like, okay. We're selling our souls to you, sir, because you didn't succumb to my one insult. I think that that's really funny. Uh, It does say that he subdued the raven, so maybe that implies that there's a little more to it than just that. But how it reads is pretty funny there. Um, I was just going to say, I think the names of fear and deceit are pretty interesting here in that, especially deceit. Because we only really have one god in the elven pantheon who I would classify as deceitful in domain. And even that's a stretch. Yeah. Um, Because I I assume you mean Fenharel. Yes. But like, again, we have to ask with Fenharel, is he actually the god of trickery or is that just what the Dalish have tried to him? But we'll get to Fenharel a different day. Um, but I do think it's interesting because it's very like you get a there's a lot you can tell about um a culture when you read these things and taking the things that they the adversaries and the names they give to their adversaries um with fear and deceit, for example, like the gods of um fear and panic are the children of Aphrodite and Ares. They're the children of love and war that tells them that they understand that love and war are closely related and they can produce fear and panic, which is a Mm -hmm. true, true statement for our thing. And I think that when you're lost and when you're separated, like it's these emotions that come to Dertheman and try to sway him from this path and then we can't uh, obviously cannot um discount the fact that the fade and spirit world is probably more intertwined here and so these could also represent demons of fear and deceit yes that's a really good point thank you for bringing that up um So I think that's about all we have on this codex entry. So I just have one final point before we can go to our mid break. And that is that, um, you know, last week we talked about Uthanera. Uthanera is going to get its own episode too, but it is important to note here that Falandin and Dertheman both are said to have accompanied the elders as they entered Uthanera. Um, And so as the elves walked their dreams, Dertheman was really the one that was counseling them. As we know from last week, Falandin is the one that really ushers them from the living world into the beyond, whereas Dertheman is the one that counsels them through that more on an emotional side of it. So I think you can kind of argue, okay, Dertheman is perhaps more the emotional feelings, even spiritual based, whereas Falandin is much more concerned with the physicality of it all. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. All right. Well, I think we are ready to go to our mid-break. So you like to read? What's wrong with that? It's frivolous. 
there are more important things for me to do. That's just her favorite. Nobody asked you to winter. <laughs> I couldn't finish the last one you lent me. I actually feel dumber for having tried. It's literature. Smutty literature. Whatever you do, don't tell Varric. Mm, no offense, but might I try? I've got a quick hand, after all. Ha, let's see. Oh, when was the last time I slipped my hand into some dark hole? Hmm. I remember a long story, that. You hurt my head sometimes, Solus. Yes. I have been known to do that. So welcome to the middle of the show where we take time to thank our patrons. Thank you to our patrons, Elisa M. and Genesis, who are our first patrons. Uh, if you'd like to get your name read out on the show, you can join the Patreon and we'll read it out on the first episode after you join. But if you want your name read out on every episode of the show, sign up to become a Nug King or the Divine Tier patron and we will read it out on every episode. That is one of the benefits that you get. Thank you to all of our patrons who support us. We greatly appreciate that. Also, if you can't support us on Patreon, we understand. We get that. It's fine. Uh, but you can support us by leaving ratings and reviews on Apple or Spotify. If you leave us a five-star review and some nice words or a kind comment on one of our episodes on Spotify, we'll read it out on a future episode of the show. We do not have a review to read today. So y'all get out there. If you haven't done it yet, give us something to read out. Lastly, or not lastly, but next you can join the Discord, Cups Podcasting and more, and come and hang out with us on Discord. Lots of fun. And last, but certainly not least, we have launched a merch shop with some great merch. Um, some highlights here are the Grey Warden Athletic Department sweatshirts and t-shirts. Those look awesome. Also, the Lord Seeker Lambert Hate Club. If you want to join under President Shelby, you can do that. Uh, but you can find that at um, cupspodcasting.com where you can find the link to that merch store and buy all of that. And that's great. And that's all I got for the middle of the show. All right. Well, let's get back into it. Abominations are always so awkward at family reunions. Have you ever seen an abomination? They are ugly. Dorian, those words you say, what do they mean? What, you mean like mendicant? Ultimatum? No arse when you're mad. Vishanti Kofas. You're swearing, I know it. Vishanti Kofas. It's Devine, relics of the old tongue. We still use the colourful phrases. And it means what? Literally, you shit on my tongue. <laughs> you fear barbarians will swoop down upon you. Yes, swooping is... Okay, so we're not quite done with the Evanuris of it all. So let's talk about some places. And there are quite a few, and I know we're going to have a lot to say about the Lost Temple of Dirthamon. So before we get to that, um, the Dalish tell um, a story of a city that existed before the time of Elvanon and Arlathan. And that city was located in the mountains of Western Thetis. And it was said that this city was beloved by Dirthamon. The Codex says its people were wise beyond measure thanks to his counsel and the city flourished. Just note that we'll talk about the city a little bit more later. But um, remember, this was said to be before the time of Arlathan and Elvenon. Now, okay, we have another place that is sacred to Dirthamon. And this is the Lost Temple of Dirthamon, which is an ancient temple that is located in northwestern Orlay, off the north coast of the Waking Sea. It's obviously dedicated to Dirthamon. Now this, I do not think this is the same as the city um, to Dirthamon. These are two different things. Just note that. Now, the interesting thing about the Lost Temple of Dirthamon is that we can go to this one. It was once a revered place of worship, but is now dormant and neglected, riddled with spirits and demons of all kinds. 
even more, the sea is washing away the temple with a lot of the foundation and the walls are crumbling and it's just a dangerous mess to get to. So the quest name for going here is God of Secrets and you have to complete the war table operation, investigate the elven glyphs first. Essentially, what you're supposed to be doing is gathering the body parts of Dirthamon's high priest and assembling them onto the pedestals of the ritual chamber. You have to find six body parts, which are the head of misery, the eyes of sorrow, the heart of despondency, the tongue of whispers, the ears of unheeding, and the hands of torment. After you've done all of this, you can summon the high priest who appears as a very powerful despair demon. We know that this high priest was dismembered, silenced, and cursed by his own people, his own followers, obviously, because we are just gathering his body parts. Um, but we know that they did this because they found out that he intended to seal them within the temple in order to preserve the secret wisdom of Dirthamon. No, we do not know what the secret wisdom was, but we do know that the high priest wanted to do this in order to keep the secret wisdom for himself. This is where you can uh, loot the Dirthamon's wisdom shield. Um, now, like I said, we don't know what the secret wisdom was specifically, but we do get a little bit more of the story via the Lost Temple of Dirthamon Codex entry, which takes the form of a poem. So I just thought we could read it because there are some really interesting stanzas and then we can kind of talk about anything spectacular that stands out to us. Okay, so this is what it says. We few whisper here where shadow dwells. Some words remain unuttered. Truths are pushed down, down, where they shall never arise again. Dirthamon is gone, he said. Our highest one brings to us this gravest news. What shall we do? Where shall we go? What of the old secrets that burn within our hearts? They will come for us in the night. Those who could steal the words from our lips and our God no longer rises to our defense. We claw at the walls, at the walls. Now we pray for a dawn that will never arrive. Our highest one, he deceives us. The honeyed words that drip from his tongue, we know the despair they mask. We disciples of Dirthamon know truth now as ever. The highest one promises safety. I shall protect our ancient secrets, he claims. All that Dirthamon once granted us will be safe. But it is our blood he seeks, a sacrifice dark and unholy, a prison of evil to keep us in and all else out. We will not have it. We will not have it. The secrets are madness in our ears, but they are ours. The highest one cannot take them from us. Only Dirthamon, our keeper, only he. And if he does not take the secrets, they are ours forever. His mind which cannot think, his tongue which cannot speak, his hands which cannot touch, his ears which cannot hear, his eyes which cannot see, and thus our highest one shall be bound. He shall join us in our silence. For his heart, for his heart, our highest one is bound. The secret that he keeps, he keeps with us. The vigil that he keeps, he keeps with us. His fear will not weaken us. No one shall come, dear mentor. In our eternity, only darkness reigns. Interesting. Two of them. There's one that I want to talk about specifically, but I just want to talk about this event because we go to two major Evanerist temples in DAI, which is the Temple of Mithal and the Temple of Dirthamon. Both show evidence of being sealed to keep a great secret, which tells mm -hmm. me, and, and the thing on that our highest one brings to us this greatest news, a prison of evil to keep us in and all else out. That tells me that these priests 
kind of knew what was going to happen. And these are precautionary, like precautionary measures that they take to ensure this because they know that their gods are getting sealed behind the veil. Or they know it as it's happening. And Mm -hmm. the like regular everyday priests, like they don't, they don't get to know. Like the Pope of this temple, they know because they're in communion with these gods. Mm -hmm. They know because they're the ones that are closest to them. And and whether they know because they've been told explicitly by Fen Harrell or by their God or because they can just sense it, we don't know. Um, But I do very much agree with you that like, This codex paints the picture that the gods get banished and at the same time, this is happening. Right. It reminds me very much of the um, the Javik DLC when we learn those stories and all of the Protheans are sealing themselves away in these pods to try to survive the harvest. And Mm -hmm. it reminds me very much of that kind of thing. Yeah, I get that. I also think, you know, this third stanza is, is I think, the most interesting part to me because I'm just kind of curious who it, who it's about. So we've established, you know, the, the Evanuris are getting banished. And then this third stanza says, they will come for us in the night, those who could steal the words from our lips, and our God no longer rises to our defense. So we know that Dirthamon has been banished. But who's going to come for them in the night? Who Who is the they that they're referencing? Is it just the high priest who wants to to kind of keep and hoard this knowledge mm-hmm. for them for himself? Or are they talking about another force, maybe even Fen Harrell's radicals? Right. Yeah, I know. Or is it just like, is there no one coming in and it's just the paranoid delusions of this high priest in a way like I'm reminded in one of the Star Wars books called Outcast, which I know you've read, and I have read with the Bardo sages, like they have hoarded away their knowledge in fear of a great purge again. And the leaders of those people down there are delusional, and they end up abusing their people to do so. Um, I and, reminded and lying that. to their people. Before we move on from but. this stanza, um, I think it's interesting. And now we pray for a dawn that will will never arrive. Um, Just so just very interesting phrasing, considering in the same game, we get a song about the Chantry that is so focused on the the dawn, Um, which I'm just going to leave the first two stanzas of that. The shadows fall and hope has fled. Steal your heart. The dawn will come. The night is long and the path is dark. Look to the sky. I, for one day soon, the dawn will come. It almost sounds Same like, yeah, it is. And it very much feels to me, even though we know that that is a Chantry song and like in lore historically has been a Chantry song, like this, those two stanzas of that song sound like these followers could have sung it after all this happens. Right. Um, and so I think there's some event that comes out this and maybe it's maybe this is well after the banishment and and, you know, the starting of the first because we don't really know when the first blight begins. I mean, we have a roughly idea given the Tevinter Magisters. So it's roughly before the fall of Arlathan. Yeah, it's well after um, the fall of Arlathan and Elvanon, because I think they say it's like minus 2000 ancient or something. And the first blight Mm -hmm. begins in like minus 400 ancient, which is the same time. Remember, around the same time as Andraste lived. Right, right, right. So it, it would just be interesting, like this idea, this idea of the dawn and the dawn in like a lot of religion symbolizes is like a new beginning a new start um there's a re like and this comes up in storytelling there's a reason that in the two towers gandalf says to aragorn he goes at dawn look to the east like that there's a lot of symbolism you know even in christianity jesus rises in the morning like when the dawn Mm -hmm. like because it symbolizes this new beginning this new day this change this move forward um So I think that's really, really interesting. But it also plays on the fact that they're sealing them in this temple that seems to be underground. 
for most of the from what we can tell at least has been buried and there's their own kind of darkness of like oh we're sealed in this darkness yeah absolutely no uh, yeah that was just the, a prison of evil to keep us in and all else out i think that's another kind of thing of our highest one brings to us this gravest news um it's more evidence that this is done post or during the banishment of the Evaneris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely think after, I think you make a really compelling case. Uh, maybe it is longer after, maybe it's not just right then. Maybe it is, you know, a little bit of a time gap. I think that's an interesting interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, but regardless, we know that some kind of conflict happened. All these people died and killed themselves, killed each other. Um, and now it's all haunted and filled with demons and crumbling. Uh, so that's about everything with the Lost Temple. So lastly, before we move to the Dalish, let's talk about Valisleen. So unlike the rest of the Evanuris, Durethamon only has one version in Inquisition. The tattoo reminds me of bones with one line of bones going across each cheek and then another down the nose and on the chin. And it has like a semicircle and what kind of appears to be a skull in the middle of the forehead. I really like this Valisleen. It's one of my faves. Um, but it is interesting that Durthamon is the one kind of the odd man out um, other than Fenharel, obviously, because he doesn't do that. Um, but yeah, Durthamon only has one Valisleen. I find it interesting that he's the god of secrets and wisdom and knowledge, who's brother to the god of death and dying. But he's the one who's got the bones and the skull in his Valisleen. I think that's very fair. Um, I I honestly feel like everything we know in lore about Falandin is like he's not the god of death. He's the god of like crossing over he he rules the afterworld maybe possibly but it's just kind of like i don't know i just feel like he doesn't live up to his god of death title even dertheman i feel like lives up more to it than than uh uh Falandin does right i think it could be say that he's the god of dying versus death itself yeah i think that's fair too Okay, so let's get into legends and folklore among the Dalish. And so they actually have quite a few um, legends and tales about Durthamon. So buckle up. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the Bear Codex, which may seem way out of left field. But remember that we talked earlier about Durthamon being associated with the Bear. So... You do get this codex when you kill a bear, any bear in Origins, which I find a little funny. But within the codex is a note transcribed from a Dalish tale in 9-8 Dragon. Now, this is what it says. No beast is more beloved by Durthamon than the bear. When the world was new, Durthamon gave one secret to each creature to keep. The foxes traded their secrets to Andriel for wings. The hares shouted theirs to the treetops. The birds sold theirs for gold and silver. Only the bears kept Durthamon's gift deep within their dens. They slept the months away in the company of their secrets and nothing else. When Durthamon discovered what had been done with his gifts, he snatched the wings from the foxes, silenced the voices of the hares, and turned the birds into paupers. But the bears he honored for their steadfastness. Is the secret of the bears how to be tanky as heck? It sure sounds like it, don't you think? Yeah, that's why they're so tanky. <laughs> Thank you, Dearthman. Uh, Yeah, so next time you're fighting and you get attacked by three bears in the hinterlands, just curse Dearthman. It's his fault. Mm. Mm. So um, this is one of the creatures that we have to talk about. Now, the next creature is the Vartoral, which, again, I mentioned at the beginning of this episode. Now, if if you've listened to our Vartoral episode back in season 
four, I think. I think you know that Dertheman is credited with creating this creature. That's because the Dalish believe in this story that a high dragon settled in Dertheman's city. Yes, this is the city that I talked about at the beginning in Western Orle in or in Western Thetis in the mountains. Now, in Dertheman's city, the elders begged Dertheman to help. And what did he do to combat the dragon? Well, as you can probably guess, he created the Vartaral. Uh, we can debate amongst ourselves if this really actually helped or not. Um, but this was Dertheman's solution to his favored city facing uh, an existential threat like, like a dragon. Yeah. If you would have told me before these episodes and all this to say, hey, the Vartarel, which elven god do you think created this? I would have been like, oh, it was Gilanon. She creates all the monsters. No. Nope. Uh-huh. Let's just throw a wrench right into that guess. It just is in- an interesting, interesting little, um, I guess, diversion from what you would expect. So, okay, the next and kind of the last thing I really have to talk about with Dertheman is about burial. So, you know, obviously he's associated with knowledge and secrets and his brother is associated with death. So there's some burial stuff we have to talk about. And so um, obviously the Dalish believe that Dertheman was banished along with the rest of the Evanuris, but because of his role in the afterlife along with Fallon Din, they do take some precautions when a Dalish clan member dies. They bury their dead with a cedar branch, which we talked about last week, but they also do this in order to scatter the ravens that are associated with deceit, with Dertheman that are fear and deceit. So the cedar branch is supposed to kind of like repel the ravens, and the Dalish also believe that because the ravens are without a master here in the physical world, they congregate around death. So even though they are technically still like ob- obligated to be loyal to Dertheman, he's not in the world anymore. And so they congregate around places where death has happened or will happen, the Dalish claim. And so for the Dalish to see a raven is very much an omen of death. So that is all I have about Dertheman. Do you have any final thoughts, questions, reflections, things you want to add about him or his relationship with his brother? I don't think so. I think I've pretty much said everything that I uh, have with that, though I do like that we got an answer to one of my questions from the last episode, which is what the heck does Cedar have to do with anything? It's about Dertheman and keeping these ravens away. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, Okay. So are we ready to talk about our side character for today? Mm -hmm. Okay. So today's side character is the original egg. I know who it is. himself. (laughs) Yes. you, You should know who Zathrian is. He's like the worst, most annoying person, I think, in all of Origins. Actually, maybe that's not true. He's up there. He's up there. Maybe not most annoying, most unlikable. One of the most unlikable. Mm -hmm. One of, not the most, but one of. You don't think he's up there? I think so. I mean, he is pretty unlikable, but like, I don't, I don't throw him up there with like Jowen and um, Loghain, Rendon Howe. Sure. Sure. Fair. Um, I don't count Jowen because Jowen is only in one. Well, no, he's in the main quest. But I don't really think you get his full annoyance unless you do the mage origin. So I'm not I'm disregarding him. I just really hate Zathrian for some reason. Um, More definitely more than I hate Loghain. And probably part of that is because I empathize with Loghain after reading The Stolen Throne, which we'll get to soon. Um, 
But yeah, so I hate Zachary and like a lot. Maybe a little bit of it is irrational and unfounded, but that's fine. Um, once I kind of like let go of my hatred for Solus, I had to hate some bald egg elf somewhere <laughs> and Zachary and is here. So anyway, let's get into it. I know for the past few Evanuris episodes, we've just kind of had a few side characters that like don't really have anything to do with the Evanuris that we're talking about. But today we're back to the theme because I do think that Zathrian is a character that probably looks up to Durthaman, has a lot in common with him, keeps a lot of secrets and has unknowable wisdom. So he fits right in. Now, if you're not aware, if you haven't played Origins, Zathrian is a major player in Origins. He is part of a main quest with the elves in the Brazilian forest, and he is the keeper of their clan that you have to go to to get their help to fight the Archdemon. And the interesting part is that Zathrian's story begins much, much, much further back than the beginning of the Fifth Blight and in the Dragon Age. Uh, but before we go on, I just want to give a little bit of a trigger warning for sexual assault, suicide, death, all of those kinds of things. Um, part of that, part of those things are part of Zathrian's story. So if that's a trigger for you, don't feel weird about turning off the episode. Um, now, many centuries, several, several ages before the Dragon Age, before the Fifth Blight, there were a tribe of humans that lived near the Brazilian forest. We don't know their name, but we do know that when Zathrian's clan passed by their settlement, his children, Zathrian's children, were captured by a group of humans. They tortured and murdered his son. They raped his daughter and left her for dead in the forest. The Dalish rescued her after this, but when she found out that she was pregnant as a result of this assault, she dies by suicide. And she does this, obviously, because she's ashamed of what's happened, even if it's not her fault. Um, Zathrian is furious he is basically going out of his mind because of the grief he's filled with hatred he's filled with um desires of revenge wanting to exact revenge for what the humans did completely understandable reaction um and so zathrian's response is to summon this spirit named the spirit of the forest and he binds her to the body of a wolf, which creates the monster known as Witherfang. Witherfang then gets turned loose into the world by Zathrian. Pretty much slaughters almost all of the human tribe and leaves the survivors infected with this, you know, curse to become a werewolf. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um... This is what creates the curse that infects Zathrian's people and Zathrian himself. So as you play this, this quest, you have to figure out basically what to do about this. And so the Lady of the Forest asks the Warden to bring Zathrian to her so that they can end the curse. This is where your choice comes in. You can side with Zathrian, you can side with the werewolves, or you can broker peace between the two. If you side with the werewolves, Zathrian is killed while defending the camp. If you um, side with Zathrian and the elves, he doesn't die. They appear at the final fight. And then obviously, if you broker peace, the curse is lifted and Zathrian also dies because the curse is lifted. And so the reason why he's so old, the reason why he's lived for 500 plus years is not because he's immortal, not because he's an ancient elf that escaped Elvenon or Arlathon. It's because he has this curse, because he's kept this curse alive. And in turn, the curse has kept him alive. And so 
part of your choice is the warden is like, you can kind of help him move on. Like, yes, these horrible, horrible things happen to you, Mm -hmm. but the humans that are living 500 years after that sure may be distant descendants of, of these humans that wronged your family, it's not their fault. They can't control it. And so that's part of the ways that you can help Zathrian move on. Um, But I do have a few more things about him outside of this story Um, because there are a few codex entries, interestingly enough, that mention him. And so there's a codex entry that says he is, quote, an old, severe elf with little love for outsiders. Obviously, obviously we know that he's a severe elf. We know he's super old, but this is like a codex that's talking about within the elven community. So not only does he hate all human outsiders, he also hates other Dalish clans, which is really (laughs) interesting. Um, And then there's another codex that's hilarious to me. I think this one comes from Meryl, maybe. I'm not exactly sure, so don't quote me on that one. But it says, Zathrian is nothing at all like Keeper Marathari, which I just find Mm. hilarious. Because, yeah, you're right. They're nothing alike. But it is funny that they would put that into writing. Yeah. And then I do have a quote from Zathrian where he is talking about the curse and says, even with all of our magic and skill, we only delay the inevitable, which I think is interesting because it suggests that he, even he who has been around for 500 plus years and created this curse is really not able to like fix it or do anything about it except for dying. And so to me, that kind of suggests that this curse came about like he wasn't thinking straight when he did this like he is letting he let all of his emotions just run wild while creating this curse and so it's kind of like taken his magic and is beyond him at this point and so i do think that's significant um and is probably one of the reasons why he can be talked down um from you know all of this and so lastly Lastly, I just want to bring up two little trivia points about Zathrian, which is first, if you are Dalish, he does introduce himself as Keeper, and he also introduces himself as Haran, which as a reminder is an elder of the community, which is kind of funny because he doesn't look that old. He just kind of looks like a middle-aged bald dude. And so you're like, you're not an elder. Like, why are you talking to me like you're an old man? And then the story comes out and it makes sense. And then my second trivia point is that Zathrian is actually the author of a codex entry, which is titled The Tale of Aloran. And this story tells the tale of a keeper who intelligently fought the dark spawn of the second blight. So just a fun little fact there. And I think that's all I have about Zathrian. Uh, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts about his story. Do you hate him? Do you like him? What's your canon choice in Origins if you have one? I think my canon choice in Origins is to broker peace just solely because of this, in that, like, it's one thing and understandable for Zathrian to exact vengeance upon the people right then and there. It's another thing to prolong a curse for over a century for five centuries um and so it it is just like and then to like keep this from your from your people and allow your people to just believe that you've discovered elven mortality again um i think it's just it needs to be put an end to so that's my canon choice i think zathrian I understand why Zathrian makes the initial choices that he does. I don't have any children. If they, but if they went through that kind of fate, I would probably be wanting to seek vengeance too. So I don't fault him for that. What I fault him for is allowing this to continue for 500 years. And you only own up to it when you're caught. Yeah, and I agree. I think that's a a crazy part of it because it's like, I also completely understand wanting to enact vengeance when you are wronged in such a grievous way. Absolutely understand that. 
However, at the same time, why did you try to hide it? To me, the hiding aspect of it all tells me that he is ashamed of what he's done, the choices that he's made, and maybe not even that he's ashamed of this curse or or of how it started, but the fact that he's let it go on so long. Right. And like, it's just, it really bothers me when they allow such like prejudice and hate to permeate into his being that like, he would have been happy to keep the curse going if it only affected humans. But because it's bleeding over into his clan, now he cares about it. Yeah, and I mean, I do think that um, obviously we see a lot of prejudice from humans in the games. We see a lot of prejudice from Kunari in the games. I don't think we see as much prejudice from elves against other communities as we do from the humans specifically. And like, yes, there is this prejudice against like, oh, well, we don't want humans encroaching on our lands, so to speak, yada, yada. But Zathrian, like, and understandably so, hates all humans, like full stop, period. Um, And I think that that is not, like, we don't see that as much as we do the other way around. Right. And like, I think like this whole thing of like, he's afraid of all outsiders, even other Dalish clans is because he doesn't want the other Dalish clans to discover that he didn't, in fact, discover the secret to immortality. He is a blood mage and an abomination. Yeah. And that he has uh, doomed his entire Dalish clan. I don't think that the other clan leaders, when they all get together every so often, are going to be too happy to hear about another Dalish clan being eradicated from Thetis because their leader is an idiot. Mm-hmm. I, I shouldn't say idiot. He's not an idiot. He's just, he has a problem that has gotten way out of control, and I don't think he's brave enough until the warden intervenes to end the problem, to solve it for the best outcome of his people. He is Mm -hmm. a little bit of, he is a little bit of a coward and even a craven, in my opinion. Yes. And to kind of like bring this back into Dirtham a little bit, I found it interesting that you said that like he would look up to Dirtham but I think Dirtham would despise him. Mm, and I interesting. think why do you say that? Because Zathrian is ruled by fear. And in Dirthaman's story, he is the conqueror of fear. Yeah, I think that's fair. That's a great, uh, great call out. And I completely agree with that. Yeah. But that's all I got for this. Um, thanks for the episode. Thanks for the research. You are welcome. We only have like two. No, just one more Avenuris left to talk about, which is Fen Harrell. Um, is coming up in a couple weeks. Going to be a two part episode, um, but it's kind of mm-hmm. crazy that we've we've been through all of them thus far. I know. Well, you'll have to tune in next week for the exciting times. Uh, thank you all for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. You can find us on Twitter at DA Lorecast. If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, join our Cups Podcasting and More Discord server. It's easily the best place on the internet. You can also support us financially through our Patreon. You can find us there on patreon.com slash Dragon Age Lorecast. The Dragon Age Lorecast is part of the Robots Radio Network. For more information about the Robots Radio Network, join the Discord server via the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed the show or learned something new today, please subscribe, leave us a review, and join the Patreon. 
And if you enjoyed our intro and outro music, give a big thank you to Pipe Man Studios. Thank you, Pipe Man. Thanks again for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. We'll see you next time. How well do you know your video game lovers? Have you ever wondered how your video game bays stack up against all the other delectable digital dates? I'm Genesis, the girl whose motto in life is love, laugh, tequila. And on Two Girls, One Ship, we analyze, rate, and review all that the world of video game romances has to offer. And I'm Vervada, the hopeless romantic cat lady and lifelong gamer. But you should know that our podcast centers on character and romance analysis and doesn't shy away from exploring the fun of physical connection. Or from the deep emotional connections built between two characters, using specific in-game dialogue and the overall narrative journey. So join the two girls, one ship, shipsters, and remember... Beauty is in the eye of the controller.